quantum particles are weird and they're real and they're weird and we don't understand them which is why we call it quantum mechanics not quantum physics we know how to use them we know they exist but they live in this weird gossamer world where things might be and might not be now i'm going to stretch the memory here you ready for this memory <laughs> okay going back to high school yes chemistry physics atom can you yes. vaguely remember okay so the atom's got a central core Right, you remember that bit? Yes. And then going around that central core are a bunch of electrons? Yes. Okay. What is true is that those electrons are going around that central core of that atom. What is also true is that those exact same electrons are everywhere else in the universe at the same time. They're both true. They're both true. And you think, hang on, interesting philosophy stuff has got no use. It does have use. Your phone and your TV and every electronic device you have would not work without quantum mechanics. So how does it rely on quantum mechanics? Because suppose you've got an electron going along and there's an energy hill in the way. It can't get over that energy hill. Luckily, it's everywhere else in the universe, including on the other side of that energy hill, and you manipulate the environment and suddenly it's there. Quantum is really hard, and you, you have the weird situation which is completely different from engineers. And the engineers do something, they say, yes, I have built a rear brake. Whereas in quantum mechanics, they say, we've done this experiment. Mate, do you know what it means? I don't know, what do you reckon? I don't know, what do you reckon? And they, uh, the, the meanings are so difficult. And so you're dealing with particles that are very, very small, and their properties, being able to be everywhere at once at the same time, are different what happens when you get to the biggest size. And so two scientists won the Nobel Prize in physics for completely different techniques. What one of them did was trap photons and then had them bouncing backwards and forwards between some mirrors, they trapped these photons, and then probed what they were doing with beams of atoms. The other guy did the opposite. He trapped some atoms and probed what they were doing with beams of photons. And the weird thing about the quantum particles, they are so fragile that the act of observing them destroys them. It's like the stone angels in Doctor Who. You know those guys? <laughs> yeah, you know that ever so. Right. They worked out a way to observe a quantum particle without destroying it. And this then gave us the ability to go and give us quantum computers, which will be just so much faster than anything we've got today. And so, you know, your normal computer works on ones and noughts? Yes. A data bit is a one or a naught. That's it. No two, yep. uh, no other two choices. In a quantum computer, and we've built some, but very primitive ones, a data bit is a one and a naught at the same time. Remember, this is quantum land, mm -hmm. right? And is also any one of the infinite number of numbers that can take up any value you like of any one out of the infinite set of all numbers. And so in the future, when you're using a quantum computer, you're using not just the quantum computer that you bought for a few thousand dollars down at the corner shop. You're also using every quantum computer that was ever built in the past history of our universe by the human race or any other intelligent race or will ever be built in the future by the human race or any other race in this universe and every other parallel universe. So there's a credit card problem, which is to try and work out which two numbers multiplied together, give you a number that's a thousand digits long. And what are the only two numbers that do that? And with a normal computer, it would take you 100,000 million, million, million times the age of the universe. Quantum computer, 60 seconds. At the moment, we're not there. The quantum computers that we have today as of right now, middle of 2012, what they tell us is that the number 15, it, we, we can be fairly sure that it's, its factors are five and three with a high degree of certainty. That's about how good they are, but their potential is enormous. Can we build them? Probably. When? Don't know, we're sort of 10, 20, 30 years, a century, but when they come, they'll be part of a bigger problem, a bigger scheme. You see, I don't see computers as hardware. I see them as a social thing. We are becoming more like computers. There are people now who have computers in them, not just for their pacemakers, for their hearts, but in their brains, for Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's, Korea, Parkinson's disease, etc. We are becoming more like computers. And me, I've got a terrible memory, and what I would like would be eight gig of RAM implanted in my brain, half of it for the Encyclopedia Britannica, the other half for Wikipedia. 
Okay, maybe another one for some music. Okay, <laughs> so half of it is we become more like computers. The other half is computers become more like us. They have this Turing test every year where a computer tries to pretend to be a human being, you have a conversation with it, you know, typing away, and after now you decide, was that a human or a computer? This year, for the first time, humans achieved 40% in proving that they were humans. They were beaten by computers, which reached 52%. More, wow. The computers behave more like humans than uh, humans did. So in 20 years, your best friend could be a computer, all because of the work done by the Nobel Prize winners in running beams of atoms through uh, light or beams of light through atoms.